year, um, it was believed that there needs to be more dialogue between the Japanese youth and the G7 um, countries. So currently we are here in London, UK, as UK is part of the G7 country. We're going to have a dialogue discussions between the Japanese delegates as well as students from the UK. Before we go into this, I'd like to have an introduction from the students. I'll start with the Japanese delegate. Please, Andrew, please introduce yourself. And I'm uh, from Rikko University, Japan, and today I will be talking, talking about food waste issue. Hello, my name is Ayumochi, and I'm from Doshi University, Kyoto, Japan, and today I'll be discussing environment and education. Thank you. I'm Haune Kose from Hiroshima Global Academy. My presentation topic will be human rights. Thank you for having me today. Hello, I'm Anji Niwata. I'm from the University of Tokyo. I'm talking about peace. Thank you for having me today. Hello, my name is Yuko Nakamoto. I'm from Keio University, Tokyo, Japan. I will be talking about arts and culture and how it affects peace. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll hear from the UK delegate. Hello, everyone. My name is Victoria Neumann. I'm from Halt International Business School, and I will present on the topic of the environment and the wasteful waste production that we currently have. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephanie Dan Ho, and I'm from City University of London, and I will be talking about sustainable energy in the UK. Thank you for having me today. Hello, my name is Beatrice Cantalli. I'm from Halt International Business School. And today I will be talking about talent mobility for growth of countries. Thank you for having me today. Hi, everyone. My name is Thomas Nobudeli. I'm from the University of Law. Today I'll be discussing peace and human rights through the rule of law. Hello, everyone. My name is Alice Prangou. I'm at University College London, and I will be discussing human rights and education. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate. Now, before we begin, we have an amazing video from the governor of Hiroshima. Hello, everyone. I'm Hidehiko Izaki, the governor of Hiroshima Prefecture, here on behalf of the Hiroshima Organization for Global Peace. I'd like to say a few words on the occasion of the youth caravan from Hiroshima G7 Hiroshima Summit Legacy Project. As you know, Hiroshima was the first city in history devastated by the atomic bomb. It later recovered and achieved prosperity through peace. This May, the G7 Hiroshima Summit was held. Leaders from the major powers, including nuclear armed states, were shown in the world news visiting the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Park, paying respects and offering flowers for the A-bomb victims at the Hiroshima Memorial Cenotaph, and writing message of peace. We believe that this has helped to remind many people around the world of the importance of nuclear abolition. Also, apart from the topics of nuclear disarmament and the issue of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, a broad range of global issues were discussed, such as climate, energy, healthcare, including infectious disease countermeasures, uh, digitalization, and AI. The G7 leaders called on the international community to actively cooperate and contribute to solving these issues. I believe that this summit was very significant in sending out the message that the G7 countries are committed to peace and to overcoming the division of the world. For today's program, I'd like all of you to follow the success of the summit and have everyone discuss with Japan's youth how to further increase interest in nuclear weapon issue, devise a plan to increase momentum to solve global issues. Our time here today is short but I hope you will exchange viewpoints with Japanese youth on how to strive for a better world and connect the results of today's meeting to tomorrow's actions. We would also like to create future policies 
utilizing opinions and suggestions from everyone. Finally, Hiroshima is brimming with attractions such as the two World Heritage Sites of the Atomic Bomb Dome and the Itsukushima Shrine, beautiful nature and gourmet food. I sincerely welcome you to come visit Hiroshima. Now we have... It was amazing to hear from the governor. Now moving on to the delegation um, and to start the discussion, we will start now. We have from Rikyo University, Andrew Kamisato, the name is Food Problem. Now I'm gonna share my introduction video. Hi everyone, do you like eating food? For me, of course, yes. Eating something delicious is one of the best part of my life. Then what do you think when you purchase food? How many of us have thought about food waste issues at that moment? Did you know that one third of all the food production goes to waste, which is also related to environmental issues? For example, wasting food is equal to wasting energies and water in its production process. Moreover, the more food goes to waste, the more greenhouse gases are emitted. In Japan, it has recorded that it was the hottest dry in 125 years this year. People say one day we won't be able to eat sushi due to the fish dying of rising sea temperatures. Then what could be done to reduce food waste? So now I'm gonna start my presentation. Next, please. Have you ever heard of this Japanese word, motainai? Over the past few years, this Japanese word has become popular in some countries. So next, let me explain about the meaning of this Japanese word. Next, please. So in Japan, motainai is used in our daily conversations. For example, if there are some grains of rice left in a rice bowl, people say it's motainai. And the meaning of this word is quite similar to the English word, wasteful. But I think what makes it different is it contains respect and affection toward nature and object around this. Then, next please. International interest in this word was sparked by this woman, who is Wangari Marai who is well known for getting Nobel Peace Prize in 2004, and it is said that she was deeply impressed by this Japanese word because this single word expresses the three, you know, spirit of reduce, reuse, recycle. So today, I want you to remember the meaning of this word and itself. Next phrase. By the way, as I said in the introduction video, one third of all the food production goes to waste. Then how about the current situation in Japan? In 2021, 5.23 million of ton of food went to waste in Japan, which is more than food assistance amount by World Food Program. And this amount is the same as that all the Japanese citizens throw away one bowl of rice every single day. Next, please. Then how about in the current situation in G7 countries? We, including the UK, occupies 10% of all the amount of food waste. Next, please. By the way, now all the G7 countries are united to tackle on this global challenge. So as you know, the G7 summit was held in this year in Hiroshima, Japan. And during the summit, Hiroshima action statement for resilient global food security has been declared. And during the statement, the word reducing food and waste were described more than three times. And now it is obvious like all the countries are trying to reduce the amount of food waste. But I think it depends on every single us whether this situation will be better or not. Next, please. For me, I've realized how serious is it a couple years ago, and I've been working on some project. And the first one is participate in business contest, and I've tried to start my new business, which is generic restaurant, which provide food cooked by like non standard sides of fruits or vegetables, but this project has ended up being failure because of lack of money and the motivation of our members. 
And first one is working for environmental start company in Singapore, and I've tried to promote uh, composing at home. But every single time that I ask people, why don't you start composing? They told me they don't have enough time. And third one is being a student reporter. I've wrote and published a couple of uh, articles about the you know, companies or people doing eco-friendly business or like project. But through these experiences, I realized one important thing, next please, which is we cannot make sustainable societies without sustainable behaviors. This is because no matter how much the governments or companies are united and work on to reduce the amount of food waste, nothing will be changed unless consumers change. Next please. So lastly, let me share with you a couple of ideas that I have to change this society better. So first one is at having, having a multi spirit. I think we have already started from today. So next one is doing eco-friendly decision making. For example, when we are going to, going to supermarkets, there are non-standard sizes of vegetables. Comparing them with normal ones, which one will you pick up? I think the answer is already in your mind. So what I want to tell you today is we all have a right to change this society better. Why don't we make a society full of multinational spirit and eco-friendly decision making? Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. How, how did you feel about your presentation? Um, I'm so glad to have this opportunity to tell you ab about the multinational spirit in Japan. Thank you. Amazing, thank you for teaching us about that. You may have a seat. Now we will move to the UK delegate. We have from Holt International Business School, Victoria Newman, her theme is Environment and Secular Economy. I would like to start my presentation. Every year, college students discard about 300 kg of their belongings at the end of the academic year. It is awful to see them throwing away useful items like books, electronics, and even small furniture, adding to our ever-expanding waste problem. So we have identified the key issue, the wasteful student movements at the end of the academic year, flooding campuses with all of the discarded items. Because the underlying mentality is that many international students come to the UK for a short-term stay and therefore need their items for a short-term use. Our proposed solution is called Cocoon. It's a way to positively impact our environment. As waste is not only harmful to our environment, it directly impacts our shared world. With Cocoon, we are able to make a positive contribution to nature's preservation. So, but let me start off with my presentation. I would like to tell you guys a story. In 2019, I graduated from high school, and ever since I was a little girl, I had a dream. I always wanted to study abroad. And finally, my dream became a reality as I was accepted at my dream university in the center of London. And next slide, please. It was such a monumental change, moving from a very small town in Germany to the very big city of London. It was like stepping into a new world, filled with excitement, but also a lot of anxiety. So I remember my first day when I went to London. I, I came from like a very long flight and I remember I was so tired and everything I wanted to do was just to sleep. So after I made it to my college dorm, next slide please, I had a really big issue. And my issue was that my college dorm was empty, not even a bed cover. So what did I do? I went to the next Primark to buy some student essentials, knowing that I would have to get rid of them eventually after I graduated high school. 
And having in mind that I didn't have a lot of money at the time and my student budget was quite limited. Next slide, please. Um, so for moving forward to my graduation and I find myself having to get rid of, of all of the items that I have previously bought. Next slide. So doesn't the cycle sound familiar? That you buy something new, use it temporarily, and then you have to throw them away? Doesn't the cycle sound sad, but also quite true? Here comes our solution into play. Next slide. It's called Cocoon. It's a solution from students for students. It's an online platform where students can sell, rent, and buy student essentials, such as books, electronics, and even small furniture. And with that, we create a really big benefit. For the senior students, they can earn money by selling the items, and junior students can save money by buying the items from our platform. So, because one of the big issues that we really, really cannot discard is the environmental issue that is caused by the harmful practices. Um, the Al MacArthur Foundation actually estimated that there will be more fish than plastic. No, sorry. There will be more plastic than fish in the ocean. Next slide, please. Which is just really harmful, in my opinion. So, What is our idea with that? When we are able to create platforms like Cocoon and find solutions like this, we are able to generate less waste and save the environment. Next slide, please. So with that, we are able to break the bad cycle and create a new cycle. So our whole project is built on a social issue. And we were using business methods to solve this issue. Next slide, please. Because this will create a win-win-win situation for the society, the economy, and the environment. So with Cocoon, we are actually able to save money, save the environment, and also be able to create a future that is bright and not dark. Next slide, please. So we all should focus on finding our own cocoon and have a, a, a new and a bright future ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Victoria. Thank you for showing us your empty dorm room. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope you had fun with this. How, how did you feel? I felt amazing. It was really fun presenting to you guys, and I'm really glad for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now we will move on to, to having the discussions. Um, so we've heard from two of the delegates from UK and Japan. We will start with maybe commenting on the Japan um, presentation that just happened. If you have any comments, any questions, um, you may raise your hand. Um, yeah, Victoria, do you want to go first? Yes. Yeah, um, when Andrew presented, I actually felt so at home because the idea of reuse, reduce, and recycle, this is like similar on the idea that I was presenting too. So I think this is such an important point to make that there needs to be like a change in like the behavior of people that you, that we kind of have to find a way to changing from like a linear model to like a loop to like a circle and I think the idea is very very well presented and so I want wanted to know how do you think we can kind of achieve this behavior change um, and hear your opinion on this for me actually it is quite you know hard to change you know consumers you know mindset or behaviors because that, you know, for example, this kind of opportunity, you know, there are some, you know, young generation who are listening to our like presentation. And I think this kind of opportunity will change, you know, people's mind here. That, you know, actually as I uh, as in your presentation, like you are present about the like application. Mm -hmm. And I'm also wondering, you know, how you approach the, you know, consumers mm -hmm. to, you know, use your application. Sorry, this is my <laughs> question for Good one. Okay, Victoria, you may answer that. Okay, so 
yeah, for me, I personally feel always like I don't want to do something if something is not fun, right? Or if it takes too much energy to do, to change my behavior, you know? If it's too much effort, I don't want to do it. So this was like an underlying idea when we were developing this. Because it was like the idea that when you have like, like a lower um, entry barrier to do something, you actually feel more um, likely that you would do something. You know, so with that, we were kind of thinking, what would we need to see that we would feel like, hey, that's super easy. I want to do this. This is helpful. We do this. So this is where it comes from. Not from like the, um, you know, like you have to do it type of perspective, more like from the fun perspective. And this is the way that we did it. Thank you. Alice, I saw your hand up. Could you please give the mic? Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Andrew, for teaching us this new mentality of, I like the idea that there was respect in the literal transla translation of wastefulness. Um, I wanted to ask you, actually, um, because obviously that mentality is very consumer-ridden, but m could we maybe find a way that to find an incentive on the mentality on a business perspective? Actually, it's quite hard to, you know, make it intensive for consumers. But for example, um, I think it's kind of effective way to, you know, make the application. And if you bought, you know, some kind of like non-standard sizes of fruits or vegetable, and also something food which is close to expiry date, and you got, you know, some points. And if we save, you know, like ten points, and we can get some vouchers to, you know, for discount in the supermarket or stores. And I think it's going to be the intensive for the consumers, I guess. That's that answer question. Yeah, please, Thomas. Cheers. Uh, so, Andrew, you said you spent some time in Singapore. Mm, Is yes. there anything from the sustainability culture, uh, normative practices in Singapore that we can learn from, both Japan and the UK? Um, actually, everyone, I've studied in Singapore last year as an exchange student, and through my experiences in Singapore, I've found, you know, one important thing that I, uh, we can, you know, learn from. Actually, you know, there are, like, called canteen, which are, you know, kind of local restaurants, and people use, like, you know, reusable, like, plates and, the uh, like, cut cut like four or spoon. So I think it could be a uh, like effective way to you know save our environment. So even in Japan, if we go to the supermarkets or like convenience stores, there we are still asked you know you need any spoon, plastic spoon or fork and the plate. But you know in Singapore, I you know you know seldom ask to be sold. So I think it's you know one of the you know stuff that that I could learn from Singapore, I guess. Thank you. Any more questions or comments? Yeah. Okay, now we could talk about Victoria's slide um, and presentation. If there's any more. Yeah, Thomas? Oh, I thought you had a question. Any comments on Victoria's presentation, her empty dorm room? Um, I bet some of you have had that experience moving to London for university. Yeah, Alice, go on. I find it really relatable. <laughs> Um, especially coming from very far and having that same university experience. Um, I think, if anything, I was wondering like how maybe you would kind of promote that platform in a way that it's more effective. So when it comes to promotion, I feel like this is a case where you need to go from like campuses to campuses and basically in the dorms showcase that this would be a possible option and um, I think with that you would have like a direct connection to your audience and the people you would actually want to sell it to so this is in my opinion the way on how to promote it and obviously also how to grow the business in the future. Amazing. I have a question for the Japanese delegate. Would this app actually work for students in Japan? Mm. 
for example, <laughs> you moved from Okinawa yes, to yes. Tokyo. Yeah. How did you do your move in terms of your clothes mm -hmm. and your materials into Tokyo? What did you do with it? Um, actually, I didn't buy, you know, many, you know, clothes, but I bought, you know, some furniture or like, you know, something like that. So I think, you know, I hope like I should have known, you know, this application before. Yeah, because I threw a baby before now after, you know, leaving my, you know, university. So I hope, you know, this application will be, you know, also using this application could be used in Japan as well. That is great. Any other comment? Yeah, Ayumi. And um, I actually uh, like did my exchange studies in Finland, and then when I moved there, I had to I had to buy some cutleries because like we had a the furnished room, but we didn't have such type of spoon and forks so much. So yeah, I wish I had the app when I moved to Finland. Good to know that your app is needed. <laughs> Any more? Andrew, did you have um, any other comments? No? Yeah, Beatrice. Thank you, Victoria, for your presentation. And I really think uh, everyone that has moved to London, such as me, has experienced the need of many stuff that were reused and thrown away many and multiple times. And I wanted to ask you if you have thought of this business staying just online as in a way of selling it through e-commerce. So have you ever thought even of finding a place right in London when there are huge cities that every year gets a big amount of students and like moving in a physical place where people can actually leave their stuff for free and try to sell them if they prefer. So that like a physical business as well just remaining an e-commerce platform. Thank you. So we were thinking, so me and my co-founder were thinking that it would be interesting to have like a base store somewhere in like bigger cities and that people could actually bring their items to this shop and um, sell, basically get the money when it's sold on the day. This would mean there would be kind of a delay between like um, you are um, getting your money and your um, items are sold, right? But this has the advantage that you will be definitely be able to get rid of the items in like a sustainable way. Oh, thank you. Thank you everyone for this discussion. This was very fruitful. Now I'm going to try and summarize all the things that we kind of have a conversation here. And I feel like the common theme for this would be I believe respect was something that was mentioned um, even in the Japanese word um, and even in trying to understand that we should not be wasteful. Um, so yeah, this will be the summary. Thank you so much. Now we will move on to the next step. Um, we will have the next Japanese delegate. From Doshia University, we have Anyumi Ochi, theme is environment. Environmental problems are the problems all of us are working on. In SDGs, the goal 13 urges us to take con con urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts. And the for the year 2030 and beyond, we have to make concrete progress on this goal, on these issues. So I'd like to propose education as a way to achieve this goal. At the seminar course I'm joining in at my university, we work at the Garden of Hope. There, based on hands-on experiences and experiential learning, this is the Garden of Hope. Sorry, it's a garden-based learning project where young people learn about nature through experience. We are exploring the philosophy and then not only receiving the education, we are also imp implementing education at the Child Daycare Center.
and then the children, based on the exponential learning, they learn about SDG issues. Thank you. And uh, as you've seen in the video, today I'll be discussing about environment and education. <coughs> and then a bit nervous to, to be honest. And then let me begin with a simple yet profound question. How do you define nature? You may answer, nature is not man-made, or nature is the things to control, or nature is the beauty, you may say. Let's go back to the main storyline. As, as, as I've said in the video, the goal 13 of the SDGs is urging us to take urgent actions to combat climate change and its impacts. And for this goal, we have a target that needs us to take, needs us build knowledge and the capacity to meet climate change. Build knowledge, yes. Education is regarded as a potent tool to achieve the environmental sustainability. Let's move on to the data. According to the UNESCO, 70% of young people cannot explain climate change or can partially explain its broad principles or do not know anything about it. And the research conducted in Japan to Japanese the teachers or educators revealed that one of the biggest problems on environment education programs is the lack of quality programs and educational materials. So we understand that there is a huge lack of quality environment ed education programs all around the world, even in Japan or even in the UK. So my goal is to build and enforce quality environment education programs that can be used in your local neighbors. And then, but wait, what should be the core and what should be the philosophy of, for my programs? I'd like to say emotions and exponential learning should be the core and the philosophy for my programs. And then it is because that according to the previous studies that emotions can drive our behaviors toward sustainability and such emotions such as a connectedness to, connectedness to nature can be developed through exponential learning. So we have to seek for exponential learning that can enforce emotional em emotions and then that leads to the achievement of environmental sustainability. So in this context, what am I doing? What am I doing at the seminar course at my university? As I said before, we work in, uh, in the Garden of Hope. There, 10 to 15 students are working at the garden. We grow vegetables, and uh, we growing up some plants like grapes, and then we are also having discussions on environment education. So not only we are learning about the information or the sad, the the context of environmental issues, we are also the developing our emotions and attitude and behaviors towards sustainability. So in conclusion, we are witnessing a paradigm shift of environmental education. In the history, we, are, we have been the packing young minds with grim description of the earth, but we are turning to the environmental education based on emotions and exponential learning. So the further question, what is nature? How do you define nature? I'd like to say nature is us. We have to seek for emotional link to nature. So for 2030 and beyond, the brilliant young students from the UK and Japan, we had to start turning to the environmental educations based on emotion. We have to start with the, the wandering in your garden or walking around your garden or picking up flowers or watching out the beautiful butterfly, the little excitement and joy and the little wonder can lead to your sustainability. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you. How did the presentation go? Um, I was I was a bit nervous, <laughs> and then there, but like it was like it was the great opportunity to have this kind of opportunity to talk about what I uh, what I have been doing, and then yeah, it was great. Thank you. Great to hear. Thank you so much. Okay, now we'll move on to the UK delegate. From City University of London, Stephanie Danho, Theme, Environment and Renewal Energy. Thank you for having me. I'm going to start with my introduction video. We can see nowadays how climate change and carbon emission is getting failed all around the world as a common challenge that all nations are trying to, to solve by having a lot of meeting, a lot of reunion in order to talk about that. So what are, we can see that 5.2 carbon emissions have been released and the decision of the UK to move toward the net zero by 2050 have been taken by during the COP26. So. How is the UK intends to move toward the net zero by 2050? This is a huge decision and this is something that includes a lot of decision, attitude, behavior, new strategies to be put forward. So how will the transition to green energy sources occur? So this can occur via several methods and strategies. So this is what I'm going to cover into my next presentation. So now I'm going to talk to you about sustainable energy in the UK. Next, please. So first and foremost, I'm going to introduce you briefly in the round of the topic for you to understand how this decision to move toward a green use of energy has come. So during the COP26 that has taken place in Glasgow, all nations have come around the table to discuss all the climate changes and environmental issues that was affecting the world. And the decision at that time with the ex-Prime Minister Boris Johnson have took the bold decision on the behalf of the UK to move toward the use of sustainable energy to move to the net zero. So as a global leader in the renewable energy, the UK has sold this as an opportunity to leverage its expertise in green technology and contribute significantly to international climate effort throughout the transition to renewable energy. Next, please. So this happened with different types of energy, respectively. We have the solar one, the hydropower, the geothermal, the wind energy, and the ocean energy, also called the tidal one. Next, please. I'm going to show you how this is meant to evolve in the future by 2030. You can see here by 2030, we are moving all along with the time with the use of more sustainable energy or green energy. Next, please. The dominant sustainable energy that will be used is, as you can see on the graph on the right side, will be the solar power. PV and a bit of the of the wind with the wind power energy. In the past, we used to use uh, fossil fuel and coal, which emit a lot of carbon. Next, please. In the UK, as you know, the UK is a really windy area, and the wind is the one that is much more dominant here in the UK. We can see that from the wind, we are able to deliver a lot of source of energy. Next, please. So this is show here that the wine power is the dominant one, and this is due to the price of the offshore wine, which is plummeting to, to the price thanks to much more bigger wine turbine that are going to be used, and the cost of new offshore as well. It is expected to be lower than the onshore by the mid 2030s. Next, please. So this is an example here to show how the sustainable world is going to be used in the future by the use of green energy. I take here an example of a house. You can use, you can see here that that will be with a energy house that will be uh, connected to electric network. We have a solar PV on the roof and we have some EV charging point, heating and cooling, energy monitoring, some cooking. All of these are electric. We have also electric heat pumps as well. 
and uh, a roof color that is styled a lighter colored roof with a solar absorbance value of less than 0 0.5. So this strategy used is mostly used by the use of solar energy, which would be used as a green energy sources to electrifying all the residential area, for example, in the UK. Next, please. So coming to this, for this to occur, it is obviously like evident that we will have like a lot of increase of investment in the renewable energy infrastructure. Of course, in the UK, the offshore wind support is immersed because the UK is a really windy area and we can take a lot of energy from the wind. And next to it, the solar power expansion will be another good thing as well. And lastly, as the wind and the solar are not really, I mean, consistently in the UK, the use of energy storage system solution will be good as it will be used to store the energy that we will have already in case we don't have all of these sources respectively the solar power and the offshore wind support that will be used as a backup thank you very much for your listening and uh, i've been glad to share that with you for my project on how the uk can move toward sustainable use of energy in the future by 2030 Amazing. Thank you, Stephanie. How do Thank you feel you. about your presentation? Thank you. Amazing. Actually, that's a really oppor a great opportunity for me to share my knowledge because in the future, that's my plan to do in to emerge in this uh, domain. And I see this as like my dream coming true already and trying to manifest myself in my area of passion. That is great. Thank you for the motivation. Thank you. Now we will start the second discussion um, after we've heard from both delegates. Uh, we may start with Stephanie's own. Oh, that's funny. So if you have any comments, questions that you have um, regarding Stephanie's, yeah, Thomas. Uh, thank you so much, Stephanie. I, I guess it's it's a question really to both of the delegates. Uh, Ayumu, yours, your your presentation was more about um, this emotional connection to nature and. Stephanie, yours is, is very practical and substantive. How do we marry the two approaches? How do we actually provide for a sustainable future as per the SDG? Very good question. Yes. Thank you. And then uh, I think like the Stephanie said, the first, first step for the, the behavior change or like the policy change, then in the, she said the first step is the increased investment and the, in the <coughs> renewable energy and the infrastructure is light. And the, I think the, the emotions and the, like exponential learning can be the zero step in the structure. So like the, the thanks to the emotional change or the attitude change, we can the, the put the, we, we can vote for the policies that like the, the putting increased investment in that type of renewable energy or the infrastructures so I think that's the one of the ways we had to like the meet, yeah. Thank you very much. So I might uh, answer uh, Toma as well to that point. So first and foremost, I think that we should start firstly with, as uh, my Japan delegate uh, talked already, we should start by firstly educating the people in having greener behavior. Because for me, even though we have the investment that the education is not there, the, in the investment made will be waste of time. So starting with educating people about sustainable behavior and greener attitude will help on the first hand at the basis and then after that we'll move toward the promotion of uh, investment the development of R&D in the different uh, technology available. And this is also a good thing that the UK has already have like some incentive uh, related to the use of renewable. For example, here, the, some companies can have like, can be financed if they use like solar power as a, a tool for reducing the emission. So these are, for example, some strategies and ways that are already available to encourage people to move toward the use of uh, sustainable and greener like method of releasing energy. Thank you, Stephanie. Victoria, you may go. So my question is more uh, to the Japanese delegate. 
And I was wondering, um, when you were talking about like the emotional education level, would you say, where would you start with like educating people? Do you think this would be very useful to have this in schools? Or how do you think where the um, starting point of the whole education program should begin? Thank you for asking about that. And then the, my name is Ayumu, just letting you know. And then, <laughs> yeah, and then uh, I've been focusing on the, the younger ages and then that'd be like the, the preschools or the, the, the primary school children. And it is because that the, the, pri and the scientific research is revealed that that is the, the great, great stage for enforcing and then the developing emotions. So I direct to uh, I direct to say that we have to start from like the the primary school children going to the, the garden and then they are doing garden work and that can lead to the emotional change and then that can lead in the end lead to the sustainable behaviors. So that is one of the plans I'm I've been working on. Amazing, thank you. Any more questions or comments? Yes Andrew. I have a question for Ayumu, and as you said in the like presentation, you conducted the like motion education through like conducting farming. So I just wanted to know how you tell you know students for you know doing far farming. I mean, I think the students are you know doing farming just for fun or some you know interesting experiences for them. So I'm one I'm wondering you know how you tell gather students to your farm. So, yeah, just checking the like the are you asking about some the how can we like the make the emotional change based on yeah got it, and then I think the like the and the later Carson says that we have to seek for the sense of wonder, and then in exponential learning or the walking in the woods we have to make the the wonder the sense of wonder, and that is just. That is like a the little, um, little being confused or a little excitement, and then, so in that context, the wonder can be developed in the that type of farming activities. I think in, so like the the shoe, the walking at the garden, they had they got to have some excitement or little bit confusion. And then that can be that can lead to the um, the sense of wonder, and then that means we are having a the emotional change. Thank you, Yumi. Give to you, Cole. Um, it's kind of for both of you. It connects to the Thomas first question. I agree with that. Like, uh, Ayumu's like emotional approach is like step zero for the um, practical change on Stephanie's presentation. But I kind of see the gap between like the emotional change into actually taking the action. So uh, it can be any of you too, but like how will you, um, how will you fit, fill in the gap between them? Um, just to make sure that I understood your question, you mean uh, how we fill the gap between the education and the practice of... Uh um, it can be the way of education. I thought like IMU's approach is for a uh, young, very young generation. Maybe like for example, maybe they can teach in detail about like re reusable or renewable energies in like middle school or high school or something like that. Um, this is our some environment education studies, and then the the historically environment education studies have been saying that that we had to seek for the emotional development at the first at the first step, and then we are moving to the more knowledge education. So based on the emotional change, emotional um, the basis, we can absorb the information based on that kind of em em emotions, and then. In the end, when they become adults, they can take sustainable behaviors. So that's the, the like the um, that's the way of thinking. They are 
saying, and then I'm also thinking in this way. Uh, thank you, uh, Ayumu. So then to answer your question, after that the people will be well educated in terms of sustainability, I mean, f if we take them from the education, from the high school, then at university, for example, we are going to teach those people now what are the available technology, like the practical case of use of sustainability for moving nations, countries, to the use of those uh, technologies for having sustainable behavior and sustainable practices. Amazing. Did you have a comment on that? No? Any questions or comments from any of you? No? Okay, I think I have a question for you. I think it's a bit similar to Yuko's question because um, I am also very much involved in early childhood education and that's very important. But how do we now do what is happening now? How do we kind of make the change now for those that are already adults? and they already have their own emotions, how do we now let them kind of go through that relearning of the emotional factor that you just mentioned? Yeah, it's kind of like tricky question, tricky comment. So can you replace that just a bit? So it's more of now, if we help the younger people, how about the older generation? How are we actually making them also move into taking more sustainable approach to nature? Can I answer the question? Amazing, yes, Stephanie. Okay. So from my perspective, for people who are already adults and for making aware of getting sustainable behavior, I think this comes like the, for the taking of policies, like that will be like some policies that will be taken by government in order to encourage, because most of the time law policy will allow people to be like much more like in regard with those new roles. So for people who are already adult, that would be a bit difficult, I would say, not easy to educate. Policy will come forward for reminding her that now it's true, the planet is in danger. We need to adopt some sustainable methods, sustainable behavior and greener attitude for saving the planet. Well, thank you. Thank you both. Thank you so much. Okay, I'll do another summary for this and I think we all know what the words would be. It's So the key word was definitely emotion and practical. So thank you very much. Okay, now we will move on to the third stage of the discussion, yes? Next, we have from Hiroshima Global Academy, Harune Karuso, Theme Human Rights. Okay, so I'm gonna start my speech. What are human rights? Human rights are rights and freedoms that belong to every person in the world, regardless of nationality, ethnicity, sex, religion, or any other status. The world's gender equality and diversity are widespread nowadays. Also, programs and policies to protect the, uh, the human rights of refugees and sexual minorities are developing little by little. However, human rights issues still exist and remain hidden. Human rights programs um, certainly include prejudice against groups of minorities, but your individual human rights also matter. Do you love yourself? Are you being true to yourself rather than worrying about what other people think? In my school, there are many international students and they are learning together with Japanese students. Living with them, I really think that we are all different and wonderful. What can we do for the protection of human rights for every individual today? First of all, let me tell you a story. A few years ago, I didn't like myself because I'm shorter than others, because I cannot speak English well, because I'm, 
I have a hard time in speaking in front of people because I'm not perfect. I've never said I'm ugly, but I've also never said I'm beautiful. When I felt self loathing I became more and more negative and I felt like I'm losing myself. To get rid of such a self, I started to see if there was others who didn't like themselves or could not be themselves because of their surroundings. And I found that there is ongoing discrimination against women, migrants, or LGBT people in Japan. Then I started thinking that I want to decrease the number of people who cannot do what they want to do or who cannot live as they want to because of their surrounding environment. So I have done several projects with the hope of creating a better world where everyone can live their own lives. For example, I've launched an, a student organization which, with students who live in Japan. As part of the organization's activities, we had a discussion, we had a discussion session and invited an expert who are studying, who are studying gender equality and inclusion. Also, I started a new club in my junior high school to create a place where students can discuss topics related to human rights. Through this project, I felt that knowing more about myself and building my self-esteem leads to knowing more about others and respecting them. Let's broaden the topic and turn our attention now to how human rights relate to peace. Nowadays, it is said that we're on the eve of World War III. War and nuclear weapons raise anxiety and threaten many lives of innocent people. In fact, total of more than 210,000 people, um, 140,000 people in Hiroshima and 74,000 people in Nagasaki died in the five months after the atomic bombs were dropped. It can be said that such a war is a serious violation of human rights. In the G7 Hiroshima summit, nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation were put at the, to at the top of the agenda. At a time when nuclear disarmament has become difficult because of North Korea's repeated missile tests and Russia's nuclear threats in Ukraine, the visit by the leaders of G7 to Hiroshima Peace Memorial Park where was the commercial and political center of Hiroshima city when the atomic bomb was dropped, was the first step sharing, towards sharing people's desire for peace. Achieving peace based on non-violence leads to the protection of human rights. It can be said that without respect for human rights, there can be no true peace. So, what should we do to end all kinds of human rights violations and discriminations and to create a peaceful society where we can respect each other? To conclude first, I strongly believe that we should first love ourselves and our own, earn our own self-respect. By respecting your own human rights, you'll be able to respect the human rights of others. If you can start to see what you consider to be a drawback as part of your own personality, you'll be able to see what you consider to be the, the other, pe other person's bad points as part of his or her wonderful personality. Some people might say, you're still a high school student, and I understand that what one high school student can do to make the better world may be small. However, in Japan, there is a well-known proverb, chiri mo tsumoreba yama to naru, which means many arilo makes niko. I believe that the small actions of each individual can make a big difference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harune. Um, Thank you for teaching us about self-respect. That was really beautiful. Um, how did you feel about your presentation? Um, I was very nervous, but it was, <laughs> it was an amazing opportunity. Thank you so much. You did great. Thank you. <laughs> OK, now we'll move on to the UK delegate. 
We have from Hot International Business School, Beatrice Cantelli, Theme Human Rights and Immigration Issues. Thank you very much. I'm going to now start with my introduction video, please. As an international student in London, I've learned that diverse collaboration is the key to spark creativity and success. The UK, with its rich diversity, has always been able to attract diverse students and graduates. The rising cost of living and competitive shrinkage of market are, however, challenges for whoever graduates or skilled workers coming to this country. Furthermore, other countries with great opportunities are experiencing issues with the work-life balance and lack of opportunities. So, how can we redistribute talents while helping them access their best career opportunities? Statistics tell us that younger individuals are more willing to relocate for work and studies. Now, picture this. Engineers from Silicon Valley partnering with designers from Tokyo, experts from Sao Paulo, and sustainability championship from Nairobi. The question is, their power is willed when they are united. So we will now explore how this diverse collaboration is not just a necessity, but it's a revolution. So thank you for, for your time. I'm just now going to start with my presentation and go inside the topic of talent mobility for growth. What does this mean? So inside my introductory video, you were able to see in the next slides, please, that UK is actually dealing with two different problems. First of all, um, the UK is a puzzle with two faces. Next slide, please. There are a few big cities that are benefiting from huge talent inflow, while students and skilled workers uh, finding themselves forced to relocate, uh, facing high living costs and expenses. However, for this, there is a common solution, as it's called uh, globally mobile talents. Next slide, please. So we should shift our focus to the European Union now for a second. They do recognize the importance of talent mobility. In this slide, you can see an international career path that's called uh, GLOMO. GLOMO is about globally mobile talents. Uh, and it offers valuable lesson for addressing the mo mobility challenges uh, that students, just as us, but also graduates uh, and skilled workers face whenever they relocate to another country. So for instance, uh, here they divided the process uh, into four big stages and pillars. So before migration until the sense making in the end of the end of the relocation to another country. So considering sensible factors such as national hostility or political systems uh, and the creation of uh, an identity for the incomers. Next slide, please. So that was about the EU, but our solution needs to be more global. So expanding it to the global stage, a common solution is vital to harness the potential of talented individuals, both graduates but also skilled workers. Studies report uh, that the advantages uh, of fostering nations' growth through international labor mobility are huge. However, to reach this success, uh, it is essential to support the talent relocation and also ensuring a balanced redistribution of the skills worldwide. Next slide, please. So which are the future goals? How can we actually achieve a more global and mobile world for talents? Our future goals are ambitious but yet achievable. We aim to spread knowledge about mobility and its implications, shed light on factors impacting the success, and provide training for researchers to understand how the global mobility happened and how to make it better. We seek to raise awareness of the relevant implications for individuals and organizations, countries, and offering some practical solutions. These collective efforts equip us to address the challenges of talent mobility, as reported from the project of GLOMO by the EU. Next slide, please. So as I started this speech, the power of collaboration, especially among diverse cultures and backgrounds, just as us here in London, it's uh, undeniable and brings creativity and drives success, as I said in the video introductory. So, 
However, the polarization of talent is benefiting just few cities, just in London or Manchester in the UK, or Rome and Milan in Italy. So we must keep our eyes wide and achieve a society free from borders, uh, enhancing collaboration. This is going to help us to breach the barriers uh, that actually also cause mining wars. Thank you for your listening. Thank you so much, Beatrice. Um, how did you feel about your presentation? Thank you, Salome. Uh, this is a theme that is quite uh, close to, to my heart as I've been talking to this as long as I graduated from my bachelor back one year and a half ago. So I really hope that this dialogue is going to bring the issue up front. Thank you. Thank you, amazing. Well, again, we will move to the third discussion of both of your presentation. Um, Haruni, we may start with your presentation. Any comments um, or questions that anyone may have? Yes, Alice. First and foremost, thank you for your presentation, Haruni. I thought that it was very brave of you to share your experience. I was wanting to ask about the organization that you've been very much a part of. How do you think that maybe that level of project can be used on a bigger national scale to cause more interesting and long-lasting change. Thank you for your question. Like the organization I launched was like for small communities, but um, it, it became a big scale, then um, well, people can know about like minority, like the group of minorities, so then they can how can I say they can deep um stay true themselves and like they will they they can they will be able to like deep um without any discrimination and yeah that is one of the effect I think. Yeah, thank you. Yes, Beatrice. I just wanted to thank you, uh, Ayune. I think that your presentation was enlightening and it's very connected to, to my topic as well. Because as you were talking about self-esteem and self-knowledge, uh, just when you, when you grow up a little bit and you are forced to move out from your country and actually face all the difficulties of knowing a new culture, finding a job to actually survive <laughs> in a new city that might be very expensive, knowing yourself first and also be respecting others and be respected by others that comes from a totally different backgrounds and speak different from you. It's the, the further stage of everything I talk about that is a further, very, very important, very important base to start from. So I wanted to ask you how you realized this, like uh, how you actually came into this topic. Well, like in Japan, like even in Japan, I'm very shorter than others because I have, I'm, my height is only 142 and that and I feel like even in the school community I'm one of a minority and so like I feel and of course some people some students say hey you're shorter and so and like I really <laughs> um I don't wa of course I don't want them to say I'm shorter because I'm I'm the same person as they are, so yeah, that was my first thought. Thank you so much. Amazing, thank you. Any more questions? Yes. Um, this is just a comment for Beatrice. So uh, I was so glad to hear about uh, <coughs> talent mobility today. Um, it is because the, like the Japanese also dealing with that problem, and then the as you said, as you described the this kind of like solutions for talent mobility can be a revolution for the society. So I just thank you for your presentation today. Thank you. Uh, actually, if I can reply to you, uh, how it is in Japan at the moment? Is there any anything that they are actually trying to be doing? Because I know it's a it's an active problem about actually attracting talents that are not just from Japan, but actually make it a global issue and a global attraction. How is that? in your country? Yeah, actually, like the, I think Japanese government is just taking steps to treat with the, the global and talent mobility. Like the, 
the Japanese government that is the putting the focus on the like the PhDs from overseas countries or like the the kind of like the the workers with high high skills. So we are the starting to take steps. I think that's the the current situation. Thank you, Yuma. Thank you, Victoria. Um, my question is for Beatrice, and I was wondering, what do you think are the current like barriers for like the talent mobility? Thank you for your question, Victoria. So there are many, there are many actually barriers that AU in particular is already trying to develop. Uh, so for instance, uh, it comes. So there were three main pillars that you might have seen on the on the picture. The first is at a micro level, so it comes from, from the person that actually is forced to relocate because of need on another work or wants as well to expatriate in order to pursue further opportunities. So the first one is the, commit the commitment of the person. The second one it comes from policies. So there are many countries that cannot even um, recognize a, gradu a graduate scheme or do not even know how to put on a scale a precise type of experience, working experience. So in that sense, that's a huge barrier because what you have worked on for many years cannot be recognized in another country where you actually are willing to relocate or are forced to because you want better opportunity for your children, for your children or kids as well. So these are two of the main barriers, I would say, that a student or a skilled worker might, might face. Thank you for your question. Yes, Andrew. I just want to add my comment to your question to Ayumu. So in Japan, actually, you know, the government, from my understanding, the government is not accept so much number of immigrants right now. And but the number of you know foreign workers from other countries has been like increasing. But at the same time, the number of Japanese people who are you know studying in the university uh, in other countries, but that kind of people work in other country and they won't come back to Japan. And I think that's the you know, kind of one challenge, you know, the Jap Japanese, you know, country is having right now because, you know, they can get, you know, higher salary in, in Japan. So, yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Actually, th that's that's the issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and I believe that that's actually not just in Japan. It's very globalized as a problem. And the, the biggest thing that we can do is raise our voice because we, we that are here yeah. today are actually experience this every day. Mm -hmm. And our, our also, mm, let's say, age group mm -hmm. is one that is very, very globalized. So we always experience the need, also just the willingness to experience a new country. But then, I don't know about you, but I love my country and I would love to go back one day. So that's also about recognizing. And there must be something at a higher level that help us through a path uh, to reach to get back and be facilitated to, in order to build our family or just remain connected to our roots. So thank you, which is just about us, I, can, I think. Thank you too. Thank you, uh, Thomas. Uh, thank you, Beatrice. That was a very, very good presentation. Uh, just as a follow-up to Victoria's question about the barriers, where does the impetus for change come in terms of changing those barriers? Is it from private-public partnership, policymakers? I know we're galvanized as, as young people, as young change makers in this room, um, but in terms of like the pragmatic, where, where does this change actually come from? Who should start uh, the process of change? So um, I would say that we should look at already present initiatives. So what has already been done, uh, I can speak about the EU because I come from there, um, is trying to use and connect to policymakers to reduce taxes. Unfortunately, this is not enough. Uh, and this has been seen in multiple, multiple countries. So um, I think that um, there must be an ad hoc path that should be created for every student uh, and every skilled worker. So trying to mm, creating specific ways to support them because there are, um, in particular, there are some phases of the relocation that are totally not addressed. For instance, finding a, a new house, wh where to actually relocate, where am I going to live? 
where is going to be my work? How far should I travel to go there? So I do believe that that comes not from highest organization that actually reduce taxes, which is helpful, but it's not enough. Should come from exactly the city where you are actually going, the borough where you are going to live. They should actually reach to you out. You should have um, someone to speak with precisely, like a one-on-one -on -one yeah. conversation. I mean, uh, as a follow-up, uh, you mentioned London, you mentioned Rome. Arguably the reason why those cities attract and retain talent is because those initiatives exist in those places already. So how would you incentivize smaller communities who probably need the talents more um, to go there in the first so that's that's a great question. Um, I thought about companies. Companies are the the biggest uh, mm, movement uh, for uh, skilled workers, uh, and university are the biggest movement for students. So if in smaller cities that now are experiencing a huge loss of talents, there might be incentives for big companies or for big universities who actually have an headquarter there, that could be even less cheaper for students to actually relocate there because it's not a huge city because it's more affordable but also it could be better for the city itself because it's going to grow it's going to have talents in it it's going to have power sorry to stop you there but sure. thank you so much i know this conversation is thank amazing uh, it'll be great to hear more um but i will make a quick summary I believe um, the summary will be self-worth and mobility for this. Thank you very much, everyone. We will not have a break, so we'll just move on to the next phase. Um, so I will start with the Japanese delegates coming up next. We have from the University of Tokyo, Andrew Niwata, theme is peace. Rebooting memories. I was born and raised in Hiroshima. Have you ever been to the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Park? This was a downtown, the Nakajima district. More than 4,400 people lived no more everyday lives, just like us. Since I was a high school student, I've been working on rebooting memories. That is to colorize the black and white photos of pre-war everyday lives. Using AI technology, the color of the memory, which was revived through dialogues with war survivors. Hibaksha are aging year by year, and we are the last generation to hear their testimonies directly. How can we, who haven't experienced World War II, convey the messages of the war survivors into the future? Please look at this photo, which was taken in 1938 in Hiroshima. They are brothers and Hiroshima Industrial Promotion Hall which is now called the Atomic Bomb Dome. By colorizing, how do you feel and what can you imagine? In 2017, in the summer, I met this younger brother, Mr. Hamai Tokso, who once lived in the Nakajima district, where is now located Hiroshima Peace Memorial Park. His father ran a barbershop here. We can see his family in the animation movie in this corner of the world. Although he was evacuated, all his family members died by one atomic bomb, instantly destroyed. Since he lost his family, he has cherished this album. About 250 black and white photos are in it. Also, he told me that he went to the theater again and again because he could meet his family through the movie. So I thought of colorizing the photos and giving, him, uh, giving them to him so that he could always feel closer to his family. This was taken in 1935 in Hiroshima. 
Mr. Hamai saw this AI colored photo and said, Wow, it's so beautiful, just like yesterday. My family seems to be alive. This was a scene of Ohanami party in Choju, and so these flowers are pink. So AI recognized the, these leaves green, but according to Mr. Hamai, these are cherry blossoms. So I manually adjust the color based on their, his color of memory. So this comes from rebooting memories. I've interviewed more than 30 residents of the Nakajima district and Hibakusha. Visualizing color of memory using air colorization and the dialogue with war survivors can bring life back to their joyful memories vividly. And we can go into our imagination so that people suddenly lost by a single atomic bomb, it will lead to emphasize with the inhumane of atomic bomb and war. On May 19th this year, G7 leaders visited Hiroshima. They offered flowers and prayed for peace. This must be the huge impact for the civil society and global leaders around the world. However, could they imagine the peaceful lives that was suddenly lost in 1945 in Hiroshima? the daily lives of Nakajima district under the ground of present Peace Park. Just after two months, on July 19th, Mr. Hamai passed away. I strongly believe it is my mission to convey the messages through a color of memory with empathy. For six years, I have advanced my activities like exhibition, movies, smartphone application, colorized photo book, and music, and so on. Today, one of the colorized photos is exhibited over there, so please see it and take, uh, and give me some comments, please. 78 years have passed since the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. The time is limited when we can communicate with Hibakusha, so how can we who haven't experienced World War II convey the war survivors' messages to the future? It took 70 years for Mr. Hamai to build his family grave because he had believed his family had been alive somewhere in the Peace Park. Hibakusha have gradually overcome their sorrow and hatred. They hope for a peaceful world so that people never repeat the same suffering. I realize it's very important for each one of us to listen to the Hibakusha's voices and express the messages in our own way. We may now live in the war before World War III, so we realize nobody can stop the war after breaking out. We need to imagine war and peace as something re relevant to our present day life. When you visit Hiroshima, please walk through the Peace Park, imagining the lives of Nakajima District. And please tell someone what you feel using your five senses in your own way. I believe this will lead to a nuclear free world. Thank you so much. Amazing, Andrew. Um, thank you. Um, I'm even speechless. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank thank you, you for like keeping the memory of the Hiroshima. How yeah. did you feel about your presentation? Yeah, since uh, Mr. Hamai passed away in this July, um, I regret to um, tell the messages of war survivors directly to G7 leaders, but um, this time I could, uh, but this time I can communicate with youth from um, beyond the nations and tell the thoughts receiving from Mr. Hamai and other Hibakusha. So I'm very appreciated to give this opportunity today. So thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now we will move on to the UK delegates. We have from the University of Law, London, Bloomsbury, Thomas Nobudali, Dean, Human Rights and Peace. Thank you.
During a time where the search for perpetual peace is more important than ever, how can we speak inspiration in order to resolve our conflicts through the rule of law, not the rules of war? Fun fundamental to our political systems are the legal principles which enshrine at law the relationship between the state and the citizens, known as the Constitution. Our constitutions are an opportunity structure in terms of what citizens should strive towards, as well as the obligations the state has towards its people and posterity. Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution, entitled The Renunciation of War, is a case study of not only how uh, constitutions can codify, but communicates that peace is permanent as an ethos to the wider world, but that we can all be similarly committed to peace. Um, however, the challenge that's raised is constitutions are known to be uh, forged in flames. Along with the German basic law, uh, the Japanese constitution was an outcome from World War II. Uh, results of horrible conflict and the vow to never again. So therefore, the key question is posed, how can contemporary countries with established constitutional orders implement pledges for peace? Okay. Thank you very much. So I'm, I'm gonna now begin my speech. Um, why this subject matter is so important to me uh, is twofold, both, both personal and substantive. Of personal connection, I'm not only Canadian by birth, uh, but I also, my mother is from, uh, is part Japanese and from Taiwan. So the solemn significance of the Hiroshima summit is important to me, I have a personal nexus. Um, also there's a current geopolitical situation faced by Taiwan. Uh, as a law student, I, I want to also not only use my field of study for uh, self-enrichment, sorry, next slide please, it's the first slide. Um, Instead, I'm galvanized by the prospect that we can use law as a force for good, and I believe that it can be used as a profound, uh, profound instrument in the pursuit for peace. Next slide, please. Now, Prime Minister Kishida at the summit uh, articulated the Hiroshima vision. Um, now, I believe the rule of law can tie into this. As the member states and their invitees gathered for the 49th G7 seven summits, uh, Prime Minister Kishida, who's actually from Hiroshima, he laid out a highly symbolic declaration um, that we could all in the world be citizens of Hiroshima if we hold the memories, um, the solemn memories from 1945 in our hearts and our minds, and I think that relates to Andrew's project. Um, so we can create a world without nuclear weapons and lasting peace. Next slide, please. This is the perfect analogy within the law that uh, the Japanese constitution is the perfect analogy for this. Uh, it came into effect after World War II on May 3rd, 1947. It contrasts to the previous Meiji constitution which it superseded. The modern constitution instead places as a central principle the sovereignty of the people, uh, the will of the people, the unity of the people as these fundamental principles. Next slide, please that we can uh, derive uh, legal um, jurisprudence from. So in order to understand the Constitution best, we can examine the preamble. I'll read some of it to you. We, the Japanese people, desire peace for all time, trusting in the justice and faith of the peace-loving people of the world. We des uh, desire to occupy an honored place in international society, striving for the preservation of peace. Next slide, please. This plays into Article 9, which is in the Japanese Constitution, the renunciation of war. It's enshrined in this that the people of Japan base their society not on supremacy and base, on, base their place in the world order not through this, but through harmony. It's a tangible mechanism as well, not only you know, lip service or something for legal scholars, but it maintains regional peace in the Asia Pacific and it can serve as a model in our common jurisprudence. Next slide, please. Here in the UK, um, there is a unique constitutional structure. It's an uncodified structure, unlike uh, Canada, where I'm from, for example. It's an outlier. And uh, instead, the sources of the constitution are derived from the common law, as well as important statutes like the Magna Carta, which was shown earlier, as well as the Human Rights Act. Now, the Human Rights Act gives direct effect in domestic law to the European Convention on Human Rights, which was also adopted in 1950 after World War II. Similar to the Japanese Constitution, 
which means that um, a human right for peace can also be implemented in the UK. Next slide, please. I am from Canada, which is also a G7 partner, uh, a modern democracy. We have a codified structure uh, to our constitution, and key to that is the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. We grow up with uh, what we call the Charter. We learn about it in school, and it's the most important document concerning our political and civil rights. It unites us as, as Canadians. The Japanese constitution unites Japanese people, and the UK's um, articulation does as well. So I believe that we can also codify uh, a similar principle within our constitutional structure. Next slide, please. <clears throat> In conclusion, key to this mission of achieving lasting peace for posterity through the law, through the rule of law, uh, for the hope that there will be a future generation without the carnage of war, the suffering depicted through you, your project, Andrew, uh, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, as well as this future without the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Uh, we, as young people, can engage through the rule of law, through these mechanisms as future solicitors, as future advocates to our governments, in order to achieve lasting posterity for peace. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. You indeed are studying law. <laughs> Thank you. How did you feel about your presentation? I, I felt good. I, I should have maybe memorized that a little bit more. I, I do like speaking, but I, I hope it wasn't too academic for everyone. I hope that you could follow. It, it's often hard to kind of, I would say, break down the law for people to be interested in. And I think that's common amongst all our topics, but <laughs> especially the law. So hopefully I was able to, to help with that mission a little bit today. Yeah, you did. Thank you so much. Thank you kindly. <coughs> Amazing. Now we'll move on to the next discussion. Um, we had Andrew from Japan. Then we had Thomas Cook. We can talk about Andrew. Um, your project is beautiful and amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any comments or questions that either one of you have for Andrew's project? Yes, Thomas. Uh, firstly, Andrew, that, that's simply incredible. I, I was actually, I think, moved from your efforts, I think, across six years, but mm -hmm. really uh, these efforts articulating across generations and, and you bringing these things to life. Just, just on a personal note, I mean, um, my grandfather was a member of the Canadian Forces. He served during World War II mm -hmm. here in Europe in the liberation of Holland. Um, so I, I, I never actually got to meet him, and obviously after these events, um, a parallel could be drawn with families and just families that were never able to meet one another again. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I just wanted to comment that it's, it's very impactful and I wish more people could hear your presentation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I guess to bring it uh, to a question, mm -hmm. do you think um, similar efforts as this uh, colorification project you've undertaken uh, can help in terms of uh, other collective memories that we have uh, in terms of uh, helping young people especially um, yeah, yeah. sort of understand the stories of the past? Is, is, is there a broader application to this? Yeah, thank you for your comments and question. Um, in this summer, um, I went to the kindergarten and I talked about my activities and color uh, and exhibited the photos and went to the museum Hiroshima P uh, Hiroshima Memorial Museum together and uh, firstly the kindergarten students saw the colorized photo before the atomic bombing and after that we went to the museum so uh, they said that this was a fir uh, this was the first time to look the black and white photos, and we felt that World War II is a past event in our own history. So, but the colorized photos, uh, like, seems like just now and present daily life. So, mm, they can imagine mm, related to ourselves. So. I so I'm so happy to imagine 
these difficult things as ourselves, as our own daily life. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, Victoria. Yes, I just want to say that I'm beyond impressed with your um, program that you're doing. It's really fantastic. Thank you. I think it's really important to cultivate a culture of remembering. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't remember like all of the people that maybe died, mm -hmm. we actually kind of participate in erasing the mm -hmm. people that are actually suffered. So I think with your amazing efforts, you really contribute to foster some sense of like peace and remembering of the people that actually suffered through the awful time. So thank you for your efforts. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I have a question for you. Um, have you ever seen the um, photos of pre-war lives in Hiroshima? This was the first time? Um, actually, I visited Hiroshima uh -huh. in, I think it was in 2019. Mm -hmm. And I was so moved by um, the whole city. Mm -hmm. And I personally feel really, really connected um, to Hiroshima because, as everyone knows, Germany has like also a very strong remembering culture mm -hmm. of World War II. So seeing the atom bomb memorial mm -hmm. felt like very significant for me, so mm -hmm. I haven't seen the um, the a colorful version of the pictures, but I have seen like the black and white versions, which are in itself already impressive. Mm -hmm. But seeing like the colorful versions, this just goes beyond like the um, normal. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Thomas. As a as a bit of an outcome from, from my presentation, um, I, I want to ask the Japanese side because it is your Article 9, it is part of your constitution. Um, can you sort of articulate perhaps what I was trying to get out of my presentation? How, how could other nation states, maybe starting with the G7, Canada, the UK, the Americans, um, learn from your renunciation of war? How could they actually implement this model within their constitutions? What do you think is necessary uh, to yeah. do this? Mm. Thank you so much. Um, I think it is very important to uh, find the connection uh, beyond nations. Like um, there, wa uh, there was um, pre-war lives uh, in every country and uh, but the war is mm, but mm, because of the war mm, the daily lives lost mm, suddenly and ah, so, sorry and mm, we experienced uh, we mm, Okay. Uh, sorry. Um, so we hold uh, we hold the difficult uh, difficult kinds of uh, theme like today peace or environmental problem. So um, I think the Hibakshas message is so that people never repeat the same suffering is common to all over the world. So I'd like to um, emphasize with the messages, not only the tragedy of war, but also the um, daily lives before the atomic bombing, because I was very shocked and I hate the peace education because every time I saw the um, tragedy of war, uh, it is very, it is difficult for me, and so mm, I think not. I think both of the tragedy of war and 
before the atomic bombing or uh, before the war to emphasize with us, the younger generation who haven't experienced World War II is very important. Thank you, Andrew. Anyone else? Yes, Yuiko. Um, it's kind of a <coughs> comment or answer to Thomas' question. Well, I'm a low student, but I'm not perfect at my knowledge of low uh, to begin with. Well, <laughs> about the Article 9, it's quite a delicate topic in Japan. People kind of avoid talking about it. And the thing is, well, as we talked before this event, the type of law in Japan and the one in UK or US is quite different because Japanese law is uh, based strictly strictly on what in the law book. Um, but I think the good point, if I should say, about Article 9 is like they, uh, they strictly wrote like we hope for peace and we cannot do the war. Well, I don't know about the politics right now. They might be changing. They are trying. I don't want to personally. I'm not supposed to say it. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, uh, so what other countries can learn from Japanese law is that maybe writing it down as a, like strict rules might help in the future. Thank you. Beatrice? Um, I'm just curious, Thomas, uh, how how you started like this um, research in uh, the Hiroshima Constitution, and how do you think this should be taken to the next level? Because for sure, uh, having a talk about it mm, can actually sensibilize on the topic. However, coming to a more concrete um, let's say status. How how would it be possible, even having it in the constitution, to actually convince people to take care of such a topic? Because if you think about th citizens uh, that are not studying law, not many people actually know their own constitution. So how would that actually mm, make them take into account this and actually think about it more before actually enacting something like that? That's a really good question, Beatrice. Um, firstly, it, it was to Yuriko's point. Uh, I, I had a general knowledge of, of this topic. I know that um, it's very topical and controversial, the self-defense forces in Japan. Uh, your former prime minister, I believe, tried to amend this. Um, but it's, it's true. I, I think a lot of us are apathetic, and often young people, we get this prescribed upon us that we are apathetic but we're, we're not, and in schools where civic education occurs, and where, for example, I learned about our charter, um, we're often, I, I remember in like grade nine or 10, just watching videos in class, like movies. Um, civic education isn't really done well, so I think that across all countries, um, at that primary and secondary level, before you go into tertiary uh, schooling, university, and from a young age, perhaps we should learn about uh, not not just the sort of conception of this, but at a rudimentary stage. Well, I, I think we all aspire to peace, don't we? Um, so why, maybe we can pose the question, we can challenge the status quo and say, why don't we have this codified? What's stopping this principle from being codified? Is it the military industrial complex? I, I don't want to get too big brain here. Obviously, I'm a law student. Um, but, you know, there, I, I think that young people are sort of innocent enough to ask these questions. When you're established in the legal field, when you're established in politics, uh, it, it sort of, it filters into the periphery because you know, you have vested interests in other things. So I think that education is the key within our educational systems. It's actually the law and the rule of law itself. I mean, we don't learn about the law, we don't learn about rights, the rights that you have under the current law um, or, or that isn't really taught well, communicated well within our current, um, our current educational model, our, our pedagogy. So maybe our pedagogy has to be improved, and that's how I would answer your question, Beatrice. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. Um, 
until today, this moment, I have less interest about uh, the uh, Article 9 and other countries' uh, article, but uh, explaining Thomas-san, um, I have uh, very interest about this topic. So um, what do you think to raise awareness of uh, Article 9 or s laws? So sorry, I would have loved to hear Quick, you answer. I can do 10 seconds. 10 seconds. Okay, 10 seconds, go. 10 seconds. <laughs> I, I would refer back to my earlier answer. I think actually yeah. we should learn about Article 9 directly within our schools, within our classes. Amazing. Great. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> seconds. I okay, seconds I will do the summary. <laughs> what would the summary be this time? I would say memory, uh, remembering, of course, what happened in Hiroshima, but not that, but also before Hiroshima bomb, um, and as well as remembering all the constitutions and articles that our law students just educated us on. <laughs> Thank you. Amazing. Now we will go to the final stage. Step. Um, we will have our UK, um, sorry, our Japanese delegates next. From Keio University, we have Yuko Nakamoto, the importance of education and culture. Okay, so I'd like to start my presentation right now. Through the pandemic of COVID, we have seen many concerts canceled, theaters, museums closed. In Japan, some people even said art and culture are unnecessary. However, as art can be a form of communication which overpowers a language, it plays a great role in accepting diversities and peace building. The problem in Japan and many other countries is that people perceive art as luxurious and do not make it part of their daily lives. So from this spring, some of my friends and I started an organization to make students' first impression towards arts to be wonderful by introducing some kids to enjoy art. So in today's speech, I'd like to propose some ideas on why arts and cultures are important for peace building. And I'd love to hear the ideas from you all. Thank you. Okay, so I'd like to start my speech. Okay, I guess they are trying to find my slides. <laughs> I handed them in very late, so sorry. <laughs> Thanks for the honesty. <laughs> okay, um, do yeah. you want to say a little bit from the, your intro video whilst we are looking well, yeah, for you. In intro video, I actually wrote about like art and culture and education, but I changed the topic like after I arrived at the UK. Well, I'm a part of the member of the organization like about education, but I had other message I strongly want to tell to you, the youth in the UK. So do, do I still need to talk more? What exactly okay. did you coming to the UK made you kind of have a change in your topic? Oh, looking at the historical buildings and visiting all the museums, um, I, it, it made me more passionate towards art. I, well, I play violin, I love theatrical arts. I was originally passionate about art, but like visiting the real things, it, it's different. 
Could you tell me what your initial uh, topic was? Oh, I was trying to explain more deeply about what my organization is doing, but actually, okay. Is it ready now? Yeah, yeah. okay, okay. good. Maybe next time. <laughs> so today, I'd like to talk about the power of arts and culture and how they can contribute to peace. To start off, I assume all of you here are in favor of, or at least interested in Japan. If so, why? Do you like sushi or do you love watching Japanese animes? Oh, next slide, please. Okay, these are just a few examples of Japanese cultures and which functions as soft power. Next, please. We, the youth cabin, came today to uh, implement the idea of strengthening the international friendship that we have confirmed during the G7 summit in Hiroshima. During the summit, the British Prime Minister, Mr. Snack, made most of his time in Hiroshima by cooking Hiroshima's brightly known okonomiyaki, and he posted those times on social media. Seeing these posts, many Japanese people gained a friendly image toward the UK. This is an example of public diplomacy. Next slide, please. Okay, today I will be focusing on the two concepts, soft power and public diplomacy. Next slide, please. So before going deep about soft power, there are broadly three types of power in global relationships. First one, hard power makes other countries to do something, compelling weaker position countries to cooperate with the strong, stronger countries. This includes military or economical forces. On the other hand, soft power is neither threatening nor forceful, unlike hard power. It tries to form alliances and achieve the global goal by sharing the same values through various factors. They include cultural charms, political values, policies, commonly shared mentality and lifestyles. When soft power works effectively, a, com a common value or aim will be shared among citizens of different countries, which will help nations to achieve international goals. Next. Third one, uh, not the next slide, sorry. Uh, the slide before, sorry. That one, that's sharp, no, uh, yeah, this one. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so, sharp power is a tactical utilization of soft power by the government. Soft power is mostly relying on private companies and civilians. On the other hand, sharp power is led by governments and strategically spread their cultures and values to the subject nations. Civilians of the subject nation sometimes feel uneasy with the anxiety of their own cultures being threatened. This shows the aggressive characteristics of sharp power. Next slide, please. Comparing three types of power, I believe that soft power is the most peaceful one. Though it takes longer than hard power, the values and agreements shared by soft power will last long. Also, soft power helps people to understand or respect different cultures and values. I personally believe that intolerance and narrow-mindedness towards a different difference cause many global problems such as discriminations and economical gaps. Soft power might help solve these situations as well. Next slide, please. There's no time, so I'm just gonna skip this one. Next slide, please. Public diplomacy is mainly done between governments, whereas soft power is done between civilians. For diplomatic negotiations to be success successful, knowing the partner's country, civilians' thoughts or values is important. Because most governments of democratic countries only work out policies that are followed by their citizens. This way of diplomacy uses the charm of its culture and friendship between the countries to pursue negotiation instead of threats by military or economic force. Next slide, please. Okay, here is a list of cultural expenditure. Oh, I will briefly explain, Japan has a small amount comparing to France and Uni United Kingdom and other European nations, which is a problem because Japanese people do not realize the value of cultural uh, activities on diplomacy. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's what I really wanted to say. Soft power and cultural diplomacy is neither forceful nor aggressive. 
This concept shows the possibility of simply enjoying and supporting the arts and culture will eventually lead to the peaceful interaction, international relationships. And because those cultural powers cannot be measured by numbers, it is difficult to get the supports. So what I want to tell you, the youth, right now is please know the value of arts and culture. So by the time we became adult and wor started working, we know the value, so we will pay for it, we will invest for it. I'm hoping those time will come in the near future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yuko. Um, how did you feel about your presentation? Well, um, I was running out of time, so I skipped so many parts and I kind of improvised at the end, so sorry, that's me. No, you were great, thank you. Okay, now we'll hear from our final delegate from UK. <coughs> we have from University of College London, Alice Julie Pregnard, theme human rights and education. I'm ready for the video. Globalization is at the heart of our youth right now. We can see it right here, right now. We have opportunities that we never thought of having before. This sort of peace has been established from long-standing relationship that previous people people previously did not necessarily have. And it's our duty to respect it and ensure that there's no discrimination amongst those situations. More needs to be done. There's a lot that still remains. The law is not enough. So what can potentially we do about this? Well, my idea here, ladies and gentlemen, is what if we use education? Education as a way to make sure that we alleviate such concerns that respect between our communities together is ensured for the sake of young global citizens. It is a project that we need to constitute together, find ways to find solutions and collaborate it ultimately for the sake of peace. Thank you. And I will now be ready to present. Okay, thank you very much. So my theme is human rights and education and therefore I wanted to use education as a tool to ensure that respect is established amongst different communities. Next please. So I would like to start talking first and foremost about the reasons for discriminations which I previously touched upon. So we can see that ultimately discriminations in all those various forms here can have visual effects of violence, conflicts, and stereotypes, which is not something that will help eternal peace. So what can we do about it? Next, please. I wanted to have a little bit of theory about that. Galtung talks about it within his work on the idea that conflicts and violence are manifested at the top above the red line, but there are deeper rooted mentalities and levels that ultimately spark out those violent conflicts. One of them mostly being discriminations, which needs to be assessed and addressed through mentalities. So what can we do about it? Next, please. My hot take is education. Next. So, from a theoretical understanding and perspective, I wanted to take awareness and raise the work of Nell Noddings, as you can see in that particular book, in her work, Caring, which focuses on the idea of the ethics of care. Different concept, I know, right? But basically, it's the idea of how can we institutionalize the idea of care. At the end of the day, we all go through school. It is an institution that we have to go through. So I was wondering, well, if we already have to go through there, why don't we create and establish a community at school for then global citizens to go out in the world and have that idea of mutual respect? So, exactly, the smaller scale to the bigger. What would that, in the end, look like? Here are the ways in which that the application of the ethics of care would look like in different ways. 
First one, being reviewing the ethics curriculum. So I'm not aware of exactly how it is, and I'd like to discuss it later. But at least in the case of the UK, we have something called the RSE, which is Relationship and Sexual Education, mostly talking about how can we make sure that we collaborate and that we create a respectful environment. At this current case, I feel like we could have more care within that, for it to come within us, and for emotions to be more respected and legitimized. Um, and that therefore create a community environment and ensure that we have restorative methods of tackling incidents to make sure that ultimately we're not separated from society as we go in the bigger, brighter world. Um, and that would then therefore allow for the debunking of prejudices, stereotype, and a healthy conversation for us to be made at a later stage. Next, please. All right, yes, so going back to the purpose of this, this technique, this method, this theory takes into account a wider purpose on how education can be used as a tool within a community setting, a smaller setting, but then for us to be established global citizens of the world, as going back to my first point on globalization being such an important factor within our generation now, it is important to consider the full cycle of us being responsible citizens and going back further into the wider community. Therefore, um, esteemed delegates, fellow staff members, I want to bring forward your attention on how can we find a way to institutionalize care and take it as an approach to ensure that there's no discrimination within our coming future. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Beautiful, Alice. Thank you so much. Um, how did you feel about your presentation? Honestly, it's an honor to be here and also to go last. It was fun. Yeah, great. <laughs> Good. Okay. Now we will begin our final dialogue and discussion. So if any of you have questions, comments for either one of the presentations that just happened, please do raise your hand. Yes, I am. And this is a comment for Alice. And then I got surprised at uh, the facts you presented, like the uh, an ethics curriculum or the school as a community are the things, the exactly things that Japanese government is trying to achieve. So like the, um, the standard curriculum, the newly uh, renewed, the contained the, the discussion about the ethics education. And the, the, the local schools, is trying to get the support from the local families and then neighboring neighbors as are like the resources to enforce quality education. Mm -hmm. So I guess applies the and the, the things you presented and then thank you for that. Thank you very much for your comment, Ayumu. Um, I think that it is a way to move forward. It's not to say that education should not be performative. At the end of the day, we, do, we go to school to learn, right? But I think it is definitely a turning point for youth, for people like us to move forward in being more open-minded and just take in consideration that we have a lot of great things to learn from each other. Thank you. Anyone has any more questions? Yes, Andrew. So this is for a comment for you and the question for you can say actually uh, in Japan it is uh, considered uh, like you know experiencing art is something kind of luxury but I was surprised to know that in the UK when we are going to museum or like something that like, we don't have to pay you know you don't ha we don't have to pay so do you think you know um, do you have much more like opportunities to you know enjoy arts in UK compared you know with other countries I just want to know about it I'm happy to answer um, I think at least in the context of the UK and London we are very fortunate in the sense of there is so much going on in terms of art like there are so many different forms uh, you would have random flash mob dances and a th I love the theater yeah I know you were saying about it but I think it is it is a very it's a privilege to be able to have a community that is so open and supportive of that. Um, nevertheless, to say, I think that it's definitely 
it doesn't show the idea of one form of art bigger than others. I feel like Japan is such an enriching and culture-filled country that I would love to know more about it. But maybe with more initiatives, it could be more interesting to have that exchange. Thank you. Yeah, Thomas. Uh, great presentation, Ellis. I know that you said that law has no place in this. I, I kind of, I saw the slide that resonated with me, but I mean, I, I think it gets to the deeper point that soft power is something that everyone can understand. Arts and culture is something that everyone can understand, especially young people. Um, is there anything that the study of law can learn from, for example, the model that you're discussing in terms of ethics, um, ethics education? Thank you very much for that question. Um, I actually have a lot to say, so I'll try to keep it concise. Um, interestingly enough, um, I'm just talking to everyone and I think we all go through it. When we go through something that makes us particularly upset or an incident, the way that we express it generally tends to have emotive language. Yes? Yeah. Unfortunately, I feel like there are a lot of conventions in the way that the law has been raised and policy has been raised into tackling maybe traumatic or emotional incidents, which doesn't actually give much legitimacy. How is it that when we talk about an incident, something that hurts, it is not even acknowledged by the way that, and the mechanisms in place to be able to handle it. And I think in that way, because it's what we've always known, um, a particular way of writing law, um, and I'm just putting it out there, I think it could be interesting and valuable to think of the conventions that we have on understanding law and tackling with things like discrimination and figuring out, well, how can we find more meaningful and acknowledging ways if we have even such short sort of language barrier? Victoria. So I have a question for Yuku. I was wondering, mm -hmm. Do you think that soft power is actually the more effective way for a country to demonstrate its power than like harsh or like more like forceful power? Um, it is difficult to answer. If that country wants the um, sudden effectiveness, it's very sad to say, but I think they should use a hard power. But on the other hand, if they use that kind of power, I think most of the global society, or at least like those G7 countries, will have bad image, negative image on that country, which is not good in the long term. So to look at the future, I think using soft power have a good uh, positive effect on that country. Thank you. Yeah, Stephanie. Um, I have a question. I just want to know if you think that soft power, actually my question is quite similar, but I want to have a like much more specific answer. So do you think that soft power is always efficient? Um, it is actually a very difficult question. <laughs> I would like to say in ideal world, soft power is always the best solution, but um, being university students and learn so many so much about history and law, it is not unfortunately. But I think the important thing is a balance. Actually, we visited the Japanese embassy yesterday, and the ambassador there said the same thing. We need the balance between ideal and realism. So I think we need to find a way. Any more questions or comments? Yes. Actually, going back on your presentation, Yuko, um, I was wondering, because we have that recurrent theme of education, how do you think that idea of um, giving value to art and culture can be implemented within an education system? Actually, that was what I was trying to do for the first presentation. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, well, uh, t talking about in Japan, we barely have a chance to uh, look at the real art experience like visiting theaters or visiting concerts. We barely have it once in their elementary school, middle school life, and which sadly seems boring to most of the students because they didn't get enough instruction beforehand. So what I was trying to do by creating an organization is like uh, to collect the university students volunteers who is very interested and passionate about art and make them explain beforehand so they 
they'll know what's going to happen. Uh, so I think those type of like real experience, which gives the students opportunity to have interest in those fields, might help implementing the value towards ours. Amazing. Any more questions, comments? No? Oh. You do? Yeah, you go. Yeah. Thank you for the great presentation. I so not not just you, but I thought most of us share the same value that education, uh, by educating from the early stage and implementing some kind of values, is well. It takes long time, but the most important thing. Um, well, it might overlap with other questions, but well, how can we appeal to the adults that like? Well, I feel like adult generation wants a sudden effect. If they cannot see the effect right now, they won't spend money for it. How can we negotiate with them and um, make them s invest in education more? Very good question. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to take it. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much for your question. I think... Mm, it's a bit of a hard one to say. I think there is that big understanding that education is such a massive platform for opportunities, and I think that our parents want the best for us. I don't see why exactly adults would t pertain that. However, what I do understand is the idea of making things quick. But I think for anyone, when it comes to problems uh, within society, it takes so much time for it to happen. It's a natural process that you can't force, but thinking about the process after and encouraging it surely will do something. Okay, we'll have Stephanie um, close it up for us. Actually, I just have a quick question for Alice. Uh, thank you for your presentation, that was amazing. So, in your presentation, you were defending the fact that education is a good like tool for reaching peace, but what do you think for people who do not have access to education? How do you manage that? Alice, 10 seconds. <laughs> I don't do that well. Um, access accessibility is definitely important, and I think it is a responsibility that needs to be taken by government of nations. That's something that's beyond us. Amazing. Great. OK. <laughs> yeah. I would do a quick summary. I would say definitely the theme is education. <laughs> well, amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you to the delegate. Thank you to the audience. Of course, thank you to the staff members. Um, this has been an amazing dialogue, and we are happy that um, the Hirosh Hiroshima Prefecture made this available um, and let this thing happen. Um, so many ideas have come out of this, so many discussions, but we don't just end here, right? Because as youth, you guys are going out there in the world and actually actively making sure that all of your, um, your passion that you have for sustainable future is actually happening in your local cities. So I hope we're able to have actionable insight in here um, and kind of do the approaches in our respective places. So I'll conclude here. Um, thank you so much. Salome here. Aligato gozaimasu.